All right, good morning. I am um, Pavlos Protopapas. I am the scientific program director for the Institute for Applied Computational Science. I'm also the scientific organizer for the Compute Fest, which is going to start today. So welcome to our winter festivities. Maybe when the word festivity comes to mind, you think party and drinking and things like that, but uh, we don't have exactly that. But we have uh, packed four days with intellectual festivities. Uh, so today and tomorrow is going to be the Data Fest. It is happening at the IQSS building, CGIS. And then uh, today until Friday, we have also the Compute Fest, which is happening here. So the two events start today together. Uh, after the talk by Zhao Ling, we're going to introduce and explain what's happening during those days um, for both events. Okay, so we kick off this party with a talk by Zhao Ling Meng, and it's my honor to introduce him. Uh, I'm just going to start with a little story. Sixteen years ago when I arrived at Harvard, uh, I was invited to the astrostatistics group. Both Zhao Ling and I at the time had full hair. Uh, and, uh, and then I was asked to give a, a little talk. I guess I think five minutes, seven minutes into my talk, Xiao Ling uh, raised his hand. He asked one question. So basically, I have to pack my talk and go away because everything was wrong after that. Uh, that happens often. It's great to have him as a colleague and as a mentor sometimes. Uh, he followed that by going on the board and explained to me what to do, which turned out to be a nice paper after that. Uh, so it's my honor to introduce him. Uh, Zhao Ling Meng is the Whipple uh, Jones Professor of Statistics, and he's also the editor in chief for recently launched uh, Harvard Data Science Review. It's a new journal, which we're looking forward to it. Uh, and today his talk will be data science, data science: What it is not, what it isn't. Uh, and I'm looking forward to see the talk. Please uh, help me welcome Zhao Ling. Thank you very much. It's nice to be introduced by someone who has less hair than I do, so it's good. Thank you. <laughs> I don't remember what I said to you, but I hope it was not too wrong. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here. I know it's early in the morning, and uh, uh, being a statistician, I, it's, I guess it's my occupational hazard. Uh, I'm going to collect some data just to wake you up. Um, how many of you sitting there, you will be very proud to label yourself as a data scientist. Wow, this is a great crowd. You're all data scientists. By the end of my talk, you probably would all say, well, we are all data scientists. That's probably is part of my, my hope today. Um, so what I want to talk about today is really um, it's mostly what I'm talking about today, actually probably all of them I'm talking about today is based on this new journal, uh, I should say platform, Harvard Data Science Review. I'm going to say a little bit more. Uh, about it just in a, uh, just in a, in a minute. And uh, when I start become, so I launched this Harvard Data Science Review, of course the question everybody asked was, what is data science? Right? And I think uh, we can sit here, debate for the two days, and we probably won't come up with to a consensus like what exactly is data science, it becomes so vast. Now, I was trained as a pure mathematician. Uh, for, for a mathematician that when you can't describe something was too broad, what do you do? You describe by its complement. Describe by what is not. And I find that was, it's a little bit easier to talk about what, it, it, what is the, the myths about data science. I think I want to sort of go through them, really using the examples from the Harvard Data Science Review. <clears throat> And in the end, if time permits, I also want to address the other question, what is AI? Because that is another, uh, is, is, it, does, is AI the same as data science? There's all these questions. So let me just say it's all start with uh, Harvard Data Science Review. I hope you get the, lo the logo, why we did that way. And feel free to look for it. And it's not like another talk, so you, 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 can, you can read them. You don't have to listen to me. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, so this was really inspired by uh, the Harvard Business Review and the Harvard Law Reviews, uh, you know, these are two uh, brands. We have many other reviews, but these are one probably the most well-known. The Harvard uh, Business Review is this premium magazine that, you know, targeted these uh, industry leaders, business leaders, and the Harvard 
Law Review is a rigorous legal, legal study. And what we're trying to do at the Harvard Data Science Review is really trying to do both. On top of that, we're being very ambitious, we also do data science education. We're part of the university. Data science education becomes become so important. So what I want to do uh, today, the, the first part is really uh, go through a bunch of articles in Harvard Data Science Review from the first and the second issue. So far, we have published about 40 pieces. We launched last July. And uh, to go through uh, the, what, I, what, what I mean by what is not, uh, what is not uh, data science, what is not about. And uh, just, a, you know, this is a very uh, quick overall summary of what Harvard Data Science Review is trying to achieve. As I said, it's, it's really trying to integrate three things together. It, it's a premium research journal. It's a popular magazine, as well as a leading publication, education publication. At least this is what we aspire to. And I, you probably all know that Harvard uh, Law Review, uh, you know, for example, Obama was one of the uh, editors, and the other one, is Harvard Business Review, is, they talk about big data as well, but the whole idea is we added this uh, third part with on the education side. So this, uh, this was, if you look at our website, you will see this is the first issue. Now the homepage will be different because there's a second issue. And uh, let me first use one of the example to illustrate a very simple point, which probably for this crowd is, is sort of obvious, but if it's not obvious, it should be should become obvious afterwards that the uh, uh, people think about, you know, you certainly will hear people say, oh, data science probably is just statistics. And or people will say, oh, data science is just machine learning. And this is a sort of obvious point uh, that uh, data science is neither just about statistics nor just about data, uh, machine learning. So here is one article uh, you can take a look if you want. It's by uh, Andrew Lowe and his team. Andrew is somewhat probably if you're particularly from MIT, you probably know him. Uh, he is the director of a financial lab at the Sloan School. He wrote this article about uh, use of machine learning and the statistical imputation to predict the drug approvals. Now, this is written, obviously, for a lot of investors as well as for these pharmaceutical companies, right? The idea is that, you know, pharm pharmaceutical companies uh, spend a lot of money and uh, to, you know, do these clinical trials and anybody... Uh, ever get involved in clinical trial, you know, it's a very long process, and most time the thing do not materialize. And uh, um, so for the investor, it's obviously, you know, you need to know whether, how likely some drug is going to be, be, be approved. Now, Andrew did this sort of, uh, really this big study using a lot of data that he was able to do it a uh, lot more than the, the previous people is because he was using both machine learning and the statistics. Let me explain what do we mean by that. Lots of people throw a lot of these data into a machine learning algorithm, right? Machine learning essentially is sort of an unstructured model. I mean, they have all these layers, but it's not like a statistical model. We know what's a distribution, and you, you, put in, you run those things. The problem is that most of the data, and anyone who have handled the real data, that you know that data is never clean, never complete, right? If ever you see a complete data, you know it's a fake one, okay? Is either somebody have done something to it or somebody feel the whole, like, you know, if you ever handle the data, if I hope most of you do, you know how dirty the data are, are. So what happened before when people do this kind of study, in order to make the machine learning algorithm work, they have to delete all the entries with missing entry, right? You have a data, you know, it's a rectangle usually, and if any word there's a hole, you, you just sort of, people say, oh, let's just delete them, right? Okay, guess what happened then? Well, first, you lost lots of data, okay? Second, that's not actually the most important part. The most important part is when you delete that, you get a terribly biased sample, right? It's like a Netflix, you know, when you movie, who has the time to rent all the, to, to, to watch all the movies? You know, that's a very special group of people. If you only study of them, you get a very distorted picture, right? So that's a problem. Uh, and most people say, well, I don't know how to handle these, these, these missing data. There's, you know, all the holes. I don't have the data. Why, why should I worry about that? And you get this terrible, terrible selection bias. And there's actually a great term called, called a complete case studies. Anytime you see complete case studies, run away. All right? the, rarely there are few of them that are completely valid. Right? It's, it's, it's just the na uh, nature of the beast. So what Andrew did is to incorporate this whole idea of a statistical imputation. Statistical imputation is just a fancy word by, well, let me fill in these holes. But of course, filling these holes requires you understand the problem. You basically build a model to predict these holes from the from the ones you don't have, uh, from the one you have. You obviously have to worry about all the, 
all the sort of uh, underlying uh, what we call missing data mechanism because you know clearly uh, clearly if something really is self-selected, you never see in the data set, no matter how you feel them, it's still self-selected. And so you have to understand all those things. So what he was able to do is to do this, go through this much more complicated imputation. He went through five different kinds of imputation. Once you have the imputation done, then you can throw the data into the machine learning algorithm and do the things. So you're trying to do both. Now, again, none of those things are sort of foolproof. And if time you read these analysis, you should uh, you know, with a copy because uh, take a, with, with a grain of salt, because there are lots of assumptions made. But he made a pe attempt to make, this make the predictions just a lot more information and the less biased than you simply using these sort of more naive way of through things in, in the machine learning. The reason I want to emphasize this, this is that this is a, a great example showing you how you do better statistical, not just better data science by integrating the, these these different approaches and. Uh, um, and so that's what I meant by, you know, you can't just think about, it's just, oh, let's just do statistics, let's just do machine learning. It's, it's essentially, it's, a, it's an obvious point, right? You want to do everything you can by integrating all these different fields. They, they have these different, di di different strands. And also the other thing is that I think it's quite, uh, most time you see in newspaper everywhere, and certainly industry, that there's this emphasis sort of about prediction. Prediction is important. Prediction is also important. But I want to emphasize data science is just not about prediction. It's also about inference, about causing, about other reasonings. And this point, like when we make, particularly statisticians make that point, people always think that that's very self-serving because statisticians, we emphasize inference a lot more than prediction to a point that I think that we should emphasize a lot more about prediction as well. But I was particularly pleased that this article was actually not written by anyone in the academia, but rather from industry, uh, Nathan Sanders. Uh, he is a chief uh, analytics uh, a scientist at the Warner Media. that he basically talked about a balanced perspective on prediction and the inference for data science in industry. And why do you need to, prediction basically say anything, you know, just to forecast, right? And the inference is said, I need to understand what has really happened leads to, to, to this issue. And clearly, I'm not, again, because the time is very short here, I'm not going to go into detail, but you know, read this article about why we need to worry about both the prediction and the, and the inference. And this point itself that I think for, particularly for this group, you probably would, would particularly agree that uh, sometimes there's a misperception about or data, data, data science is just like analyzing data. Well, analyzing data is really a very tiny part. Anybody who have really handled the data, you know you spend most time cleaning the data, collect the data, clean data, pre-process data. By the time you do analysis, well, like 80% or 90% of work is sort of already done. In fact, often by the time you do analysis, you discover a problem, it's too late, because you already have pre-processed everything, you know, so, so, so much. And uh, um, so this is article was written by Jeanette Wing, uh, who is the uh, director of the uh, Data Science Institute at uh, Columbia, and she wrote this whole thing about this whole daily life cycle. I'm going to show you that, 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 that you know that uh, that picture in in a minute. And uh, so this this is Jeanette, and she basically said, you know, this is probably too small, but let me read. If you think about the data life cycle, you have the generation, data generation, collection, processing, storage, uh, management, analysis, visualization, interpretation. So analysis is just the one part of it. It's the important part. You have to recognize that's only one part. Now, here's the interesting being the editor of the Harvard Data Science Review, because I try really to be as broad as possible. When I read Jeanette's article, I said, you know, that pretty much covers everything. What else is there? Right? I mean, you know, being a statistician, being, I was trying to pretty broad. I said, Jeanette was great. You, you did great work. Well, until I invite uh, philosophers and, and, and social scientists, then you will see they have other things going on. And then, then I realized, oh, that's, that is very important. For example, this is the point, DS is not a discipline that sits merely in STEM field. Most people think about data science, just think about, oh, that is, you know, that's all about quantitative analysis, it's all, all, all the STEM fields. Well, here is the uh, article by, uh, I'm gonna show you who they are. One is by a social scientist, one is by a humanist, one is about the lives and afterlives of the data, and uh, that's actually really important for this whole concept of replicability, reproducibility. You need people to, you did the analysis, how you preserve everything for others to replicate what you do if you don't give enough record of how people do that. And then you have, before everything else, there are philosophers coming and say, wait, wait a minute, there's no such thing as raw data. 
Anytime you start to think about collecting data, you already have a conceived notion of what you want to collect, how you want to measure it, everything actually you need, human judgment is already there. Because most of the time we think, let data speak, right? Sort of the idea of data itself is, is, is so objective. But anyone, you really have collected data, you know, particularly in social science, you know, if you have design questionnaire, you can, you can lead things in a ways that sometimes is just crazy. Right. And uh, one example I remember is years ago I was at the University of Chicago. One day I was listening to uh, the, uh, the, I'm not mentioning which station these days, all the stations are a little bit crazy, so I'm not going to mention which station. Uh, but one station was saying, okay, so there was this anchor man was saying, well, um, some study just showed that 40% of the American children are suffering hunger. I said, number wow, that's extraordinary. I mean, you know, that's it's possible, but it's 40% sounds to me was really quite, a, quite extraordinary, right? So I, but you know, I, it stuck in my mind. What's interesting is a week later, another station had a show basically say how these surveys misled people, and they, of course, used that as an example, okay? And the way they, they, they of course, that's another selected example they, they, they show is that, you know, how did they get the 40% of data, uh, the, the, the number? Because the question asked the stu ask, ask these kids say, um, is there any time in your life that your parents had the limited amount of food you want to eat? <laughs> I was surprised it's only 40%, you know, if you, if you, if you, I mean, it's, it's a question, right? So most time, well, we don't see those. Most time when it is reported, you, I mean, you don't, you don't see it. The point here is that it's really, uh, 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 this point is being made here, is really the data itself, you know, Depends on how you ask. We can kind of all kinds of things. So this was um, Chris Bogman wrote. He, she's a uh, leading scholar in library and information science. And her point, as I said, is really, you have to really think about the afterlife of the data. Like once you did it, like how do you preserve? How do you, you know? There's data curation, data provenance. It's all very important, particularly for replicability, uh, reproducibility. And that's kind of issues like library science studies is. The rest of us will probably have some common notions, but we are not the expert of those things. So that's a very important. And then again, as I, as I said, this is, the, this is by the philosopher. Um, she's a really leading philosopher. She's talking about you know, the data governance is key to the interpretation. How do you think about the data from the very beginning? So you can see that Janelle was really talking about the middle part. There's even before the data con conceived, and there's the after you have done analysis. That gives you that multiple. Discipline perspective is really give you a little bit more than we usually think about what data science is. But my biggest point here is, is uh, I was hoping it's going to be a controversial one, but it turned out to be not really controversial because there are more people realize that's, that's what it is. So, but let me lead to, the, to my last point. So the question is like, what should be a data scientist skill set? Now you can Google it. You Google it, you will find Tons of diagrams, all right? You look at them, this is one of them from this book called uh, uh, Data Science. You look at them and say, well, that's pretty scary. I'm, I'm glad I'm not in school these days. Uh, I'm, I'm in school teaching, but not taking exams. How the hell am I gonna learn all this stuff, right? You know, I need to be, a, I need to know data wrangling, computer data visualization, static probability, machine learning, communication, domain expertise, data access, regulation, sort of everything. It's, it's a very desirable, right? Yes, I, I would agree. I think every one of you would agree, if I know all this stuff, I will be very employable, right? In the, well, this is not just one list. Look at another list. You just, you Google it. You, you will find that this one has uh, analytics, data management, technology, art design, entrepreneurship. Usually we don't emphasize that, but if you're in the data science space, you know why that's important. Then you look at another long list, right? I, I'm, I'm not cherry picking. You just, you, you Google your, yourself. You will find all these all this lists. Well, the, the more I saw this list, I, I realized, I say, you know, there's a problem here. Right? There's a problem here. This is the phenomenon when something's new that is so desirable, everybody wants everything. But this is not the way that if this university to design programs, okay? It's, this is not the way to put everything together because what's going to happen if you do that, you basically have these programs that teach everybody to know a little bit of everything and a very little of anything deep. And that is just, maybe, you know, we need a group of people like that. But it's just not a, a, a very well sought program trying to do any of those. So I just to alert people, like, you know, you guys probably have heard Tigermon, okay, the, the concept. I said, well, let's don't make 
Don't make science, data science like a tiger mom or tiger parent. Like you demand the person that you need to learn all those things, piano, play basketball, whatever you don't want to do, right? It's just, a, it's, it's just way too much. So my point of make, and this turned out to be really not a, a, that controversial anymore because many more people start to realize that DS is not even single discipline by itself. The way I'm, I think about it is, that, and, it, and saying this is just not a rhetorical. This is very important for university administrators, administrations. You know, I was a dean for five years, so I know this, this kind of thing is very important. Because if you think about it as a discipline, what do you do? You build a department. That's what a department function is too, right? But if you think beyond the discipline, you don't build a department. You will, you will build a school, okay? Now, the, the, the way I think about it is that we all have heard there are science and the scientists, right? You can say, oh, I'm a scientist, okay? But and then most people say, oh, it's great, you're a scientist, but what kind of science do you do? Right? Are you a biologist? Are you a physicist? There's no, you rarely hear there's a university, there's a, there's a department of science. There's a school of science. Now, there are few universities, not even universities, few small colleges, they don't have enough resources, they put everything together, you will see a department of science. Okay? So the idea I'm here I'm thinking about is, like, thinking about the other science is at the science level. Same as you have heard of social science or social scientist, you, you rarely hear a department of social science. You have a department of sociology, you have a department of social work, but that's, that's different. Same as humanities humanist, right? You rarely hear there's a department of humanities, okay? And of course, uh, the last one got, gave me some trouble. I was giving this talk in Cambridge, the real Cambridge, not, not the fake one. Um, <laughs> And I said, well, you know, you, there are engineers and there are engineers, but you never heard of the Department of Engineer. Of course, Cambridge has a Department of Engineer. So I was right in the face. But hey, the rest of us do right, right? We have engineering school here, you know. But the concept here is that data science becomes so broad. And if you look around now, is that university recognized. And uh, I think this is the one I'm going to give it. Berkeley, I think, is being a leading uh, leaders in that. They just set up this... Uh, uh, division of data science. Their division actually is larger than even schools. There's across the university wise. And uh, their first uh, uh, leader, associate uh, provost, actually turned out to be uh, one, of, uh, one of my uh, co editors on, on this uh, Harvard Data Science Review, Jennifer Chase, uh, who used to be at the Microsoft here. And, and so she's absolutely terrific. And uh, their other universities are star building schools. Uh, three days ago, I got the news that the UNC just started a new school of data science. I know uh, CityU of Hong Kong just started a school of data science. Uh, I think not too long ago was here, uh, Michael Jordan, as another co-editor of mine, was here talking about, he was saying, you know, as long as once you have a five, six of universities doing it, that it it's going to happen pretty quickly. And this is, if you think about it, he had a great point. If you think about the, for the last century, how many times the university had a chance to build a new kind of schools? Probably not, because it's all built a long time ago. So this will be, you will see a new wave that it may or may not, whether it's called a school of AI, school of computer science, or school of data science, these names are debatable. Uh, but you will see that kind of structure. And the one, one sort of key features of these kind of schools is they, they're, they're not science, they're not social science, they're not humanity because they permeate everything. And that's the sort of new signature from, from university level. So I really hope that, uh, um, that you all, you all, you know, you should be very proud of yourself. You are a data scientist now, okay? whatever you do, anything related to data, because we, we all work on those things. So uh, in my first editorial, trying to summarize all those things, that's what the five points I made. I wrote this, uh, this editorial called Data Science and Artificial Ecosystem. I use the word artificial really very much like people use the word for artificial, uh, artificial uh, uh, intelligence. Both men, both men it's, it's a human made, it's also heavily computer-based. Okay, that's the uh, you, you know that's the issue. But but also uh, when I say ecosystem, it's really because as you see that what's really happening the, with all this evolution of data science, it's changing each field itself. It's certainly changing the statistics. Okay, I'm, all my colleagues would agree. The way we think about things like it's now, you know, we for the past five to 10 years, we resist the change, you know, but eventually we realize you have to change with it, because that's what the ecosystem does. If you don't, you become extinct. I mean, that's, and, uh, and there have been real worries, like what statistics still be valuable five years, 10 years, 20 years from now? I think we, we will, we will still, but the thing is that you do have to evolve. For example, uh, the whole idea how to do machine learning is a, a very interesting 
phenomena. Why it is, you know, deep learning is the one thing everybody talk about, but few has really deep understanding, so we need to go from deep learning to deep end understanding, and, and that's it's itself really uh, uh, pushed a lot of theoretical work as well. So I think that's, that's absolutely uh, important. In my second editorial, I um, wrote a follow-up, this is on the second issue, and I was really inspired by one particular article that they talk about from uh, 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 NC State. They have, um, they have a, a lab really is doing work, so three-way interaction, industry, government, and, and uh, uh, academia. It was a lab trying to work for all these, uh, what they call the intelligence uh, uh, sector. And it was quite interesting that I went read it, I realized that there are all these, what I call 3D surroundings. There are all these sort of three pieces structure that are really creates this uh, very uh, 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 a dynamic you know, data science ecosystem. Let me just, just, just list them, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of specific one of them. The, the whole idea is now the data science is no longer, actually data science itself, unlike many others, right? They are, lots of revolution happens because of industry. Uh, traditionally, lots of things happen in academia, then you have this whole concept of knowledge transfer implementation goes to the net. But data science, certainly deep learning, all those stuff is, is really coming from industry. I want to say a little bit more later about what government is doing, because this, 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 really, this is really that three, actually by government, I also including NGOs, others. So this is, the, this is one big sort of 3D dimensions. The other is, as I already mentioned, right, even inside academia, you have to worry about human, humanity, social science, and, and the STEM. This is the interesting one. This is the one probably people uh, may or may not realize. That's actually incredibly important. I say, this is a, I say it's a spatial, temporal, and a structural. I don't mean necessarily say, it's spa you say, oh, spatial means the data is measuring some spatial uh, thing, or temporal, it's, you know, it's a time series. No, I don't mean that. I mean the data set themselves. Data's, data's are local. Uh, actually, there's this great book called, you shouldn't worry about data set, you should worry about data setting. Because it's what is the setting matters. Data is local. Data has time stamp on it. Like, you know, data collected today and data collected tomorrow uh, because the time changes, right? The data is shaped by, 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 the, by the time that, that you're, you are in. And the, and, and the structural one is, I think, is really very important. Traditionally, as a statistician, we will say there are three kinds of fundamental sort of a structure of the data. Now there's a fourth kind I'm going to mention just in a second. What are three fundamental ways to think about the data? One is uh, the best data, people will say, is the kind of experimental data. Like, you know, like a clinical trial, you control where to observe, you have, you have control group. That, that's kind of data, if you do well, allow you to even make causal inference. Then the next one is say you have less control, but you still can sort of to a extent to control who you want to observe from is the sample survey. Or lots of survey data, the idea is, yeah, you, you cannot manipulate people's behavior, but you get selected to which, which, which group. Now, you have to be careful there as well uh, because there's an incredible self-selection there. People refuse to respond to you. And the kind of data which is vast out there and is most data people analyze, and it's the worst kind of data in the sense that it's the hardest to analyze, is the observational data. You, you, you got to observe whatever people report. That is a huge amount of... Uh, a bias, and that's the whole problem. Okay, you need to worry about the thing. Now, these are the traditional three sort of big structure when I talk of structure. Now there's a fourth kind, and it's kind of coming, actually not, yeah, it's coming this year, right? Now you have all these data, but this will be a, a particularly, uh, that you, you probably have heard about. The US Census Bureau has made an announcement that the 2020 census, which uh, on April 1st, you fill out your forms, they will be released with what they call, will be protected by a mechanism called the differential privacy. The idea is that data will be released only after injecting a lot of noises. Now it's like a structural. All the data you're gonna analyze, all the social scientists, we have articles coming, uh, some of them get very nervous about. It. Now all the data you have, especially from the census, that it's gonna be, you just never see any real data. It's all noise injected. What does it mean? How does it affect your analysis? How do you denoise it, right? The whole idea is, is very simple. I want, people, uh, I want to protect people's privacy. But there's no free lunch, right? That's a principle in life. And then I mean, you feel like you're eating free lunch, somebody has paid for it, or maybe you have even paid yourself, you just forgot, that uh, uh, you know, you, we, we all like, as humans, we all 
I mean, this, the whole data privacy uh, 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 utility trade-off, I want to say a few words about, because that is a, such a great example of why data science had to be, we had to work all together for, for, you know, for that's, uh, such a problem. Everybody would agree that anytime you deal with data privacy and data utility trade-off, that's squarely a very important problem in data science. Uh, but it's not a problem that a statistician and computer scientist we can solve, or anybody can solve alone, because there's a fundamental trade-off here. Right? Here's the, here's the dilemma. As individual human beings, we all like to collect lots of information that, you know, make my life better, no other things. But the only problem is, yeah, please don't collect my information, right? I'm interested in what other people do. Now, the problem is the other people's other people is me. So there's just no way to get around it, okay? So the, the, the things like how much noise the Census Bureau need to inject, it's not a question any one single person can answer. All the legal scholars, it's, it's society had to decide that. But now the society, you know how divided we are these days. Like this, this is a, you, will, you will see lots of lawsuits, all, the, all kinds of things is going to happen. Once you, because you know, it's going to affect the minority group differently than other groups when these, these noise come in. So these are issues are squarely formed like for philosophy, legal scholars, social scientists, like everyone had to be involved. And it's, it, it's a great area for any of you if you're looking for some really important problem to work on. This one is going to last a long, long, long time. Well, actually, probably forever, because we would never end the debate what's the right amount of protection. And also, because the Census Bureau cannot do individual protection just depending on what analysis you're doing. They have to release the one protection. Let's think about like, what is the one protection that everybody would be happy? In fact, probably none, none would be happy. But they have to do it. The law requires them, the Constitution requires them to collect the data as accurate as possible. And that the law also requires them to protect the privacy as much as they can. So they were doing an impossible job. I'm emphasizing this because the whole census group, uh, the leader was here not too long ago. We had this meeting and we had this whole, whole, whole session about these issues. I want to really emphasize that that's a one example about how, why the data science becomes so broad. Because it's affected everyone's life. And, and not, no single discipline, or even collection of them, can solve these problems. Oh, you know, we, 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 we deal with it. That's simply not the case. It's, it's just part of our life. We just all need to at least know what what's gets, get, gets involved. So that's a structure issue is, is really very important. And this one that I actually was uh, another, uh, the, 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 the CEO of the uh, canine uh, company wrote article again on the second issue, really talking about what kind of skill set in the industry and she, he talked about novels, apprentices, and experts. It was a really, it's a really great way of to uh, list these three groups. And it happened in the first issue that our provost, Alan Garber, also wrote uh, three groups about the students, like the way he thinks about in terms of deliver education needs. And again, I think you would all agree that broadly speaking, there are three, three kinds of uh, 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 needs. One are the people that want to become expert. They want to become a data scientist. We, you, of course, give them that much more you know, broad, but also deep training, right, training. And the other groups are the people who themselves, may or may, they may not want to be a data scientist per se, but they want to use the most advanced data science technology uh, uh, methods to advance their you know, field, if they're physics or chemist, but so they know, need to know enough. But they're not, they not the ones developing these methodologies. And then, of course, the largest group is simply being a citizen in a digital age. You need to know something basic. When people, you know, you probably, old days you hear about p-values, right? There's a lot of controversy with the p-values. But now you hear a phrase like FDR. What is FDR? I mean, it's, you know, false discovery rate. You will see the paper say, oh, we control false discovery rate. And that sounds pretty intuitive, false discovery. You shouldn't have, but how to control it? What that measure? How do they measure? There are all these different versions, right? As a, as a, as a citizen of, of the, uh, this digital age, you just need some really basic knowledge, even when people use these terms. Right? And I'm just using, you know, pick up, pick up one, one term. And the last one, I think it's, it's a really pedagogical one that I, I, you know, I think it's a very important for us to all realize, particularly in a university setting. We have been emphasizing pretty much the concept of being analytical. Like a lot of trainings, if you look at now, certainly computer science, statistics, machine learning, is a lot about you know, being analytical. Uh, but if you think of this very broadly, that is only one part. You need to also training thinking very philosophical. The whole idea of data ethics, right? The whole idea of uh, treating utility versus, versus uh, privacy. I mean, these thinkings are, you know, these are like philosophers 
think of those. It's, the, it's, it's not something that, you know, usually the analytical mind helps you to get the answer. Uh, the analytical mind can help you get the answer if you have a way to formulate into an optimization problem. If you have utility function, you have an object function, in the end they say, oh, now let me crank the mathematical machinery to figure out what is the optimal trade-off. Okay? But unfortunately, there's no such thing. There's no objective function we all would all agree, agree on. And the, to do that itself, it takes a lot more philosophical thinking, a lot more social sciences thinking than the analytical thinking. And the other end, you have to be practical. Right? Okay, this is one of the things that, like being a you know, statistician, usually being accused of being, uh, and I can say this because I'm a you know, statistician, that uh, we're, we, we emphasize a lot of things about our principles. We, we do a lot. Right? And, and to a point, there's a sort of a kind of stereotypical complaint, the statisticians are willing to, uh, to a point to, to say, there's nothing I can do. Right? You can be data says that's way too dirty. Yeah. That's, the best thing is not to touch it. Right? Okay. Now that's not very helpful. Now if you're in a company of things, this, this is what happens is the machine learning comes in. Right? Now stereotypical complaint about them is they always deliver answer, even they shouldn't. Right? And so that's the two stereotype, two extreme. Like, statistician would be willing to do nothing, and the machine learners, of course, that's extreme stereotype. Machine learners are sort of willing to do, it, to do anything. Now, you will see both are not great position to have. So the, the, the best thing to do is somehow recognize you need to be practical, but you also need to be principled. So the one phrase I've, I've been using is I call the principled corner cutting. You need to understand the principle then to cut the corner. So I, you know what to cut. Like, you know, you, run linear, you do linear regression first. Now, if you don't understand it, say, well, that's the model. That's, that's a black box. But anyone who has know the principle of the linear regression, you know, that's a first order Taylor expansion, right? That's a mathematical word. But the idea is that, you know, that's a first approximation. If I have more data, more time, more resources, I add a quadratic term. You know, you have these way of thinking about those, those things. They're, they're principles. So you know where the call, if you have, if you know there's a problem, you know where to fill the holes. So I think we, we need to do lots of training of people's, uh, when I say practical, I don't mean just sort of do anything. It's a really the concept here is trying to do things um, in a way that, uh, you know, that you don't do what we do, so oh, we can't touch the data. But you know you, you know you have to do something. And you know what mistakes or errors you're making, but that's the best you can do. In lifetime, you know, lots of things is like that. And that, that kind of training, we don't have that much in, 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 in the sort of current education. We tend to have treat lots of methodology, then say, okay, let's find an example to illustrate this methodology, okay? What I really like to what we do is take a real problem, take a really hard problem, climate change, one of those big problems, Go through it and see what it is. Then you see, okay, here is the current. We know this probably is really bad, but that's all we have now. That doesn't mean that we're going to say this is the answer, but it, it, it's a starting point of the first exploration, but it's also end the point and say that's what we conclude by now, right? So you really need to, and that's, that's a much more nuanced training, and I think, I hope this whatever uh, new school of data science, it, that kind of training had to be a part of it, right? So, um, well, let me give this, uh, this, uh, this picture. I probably, when should I end? Another hour? 40 minutes? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, let me just sort of, maybe I just, just end on, on, on this part. I was thinking about what are the emerging things that become so common in, in business industry. So these are three, three sectors, right? And I was really thinking about from the data science perspective, what are the things emerging? What are the big themes that now become a priority for all these three major sectors. And the two things I come up with, and uh, one is Essex. Uh, this has become, you know, we all understand Essex what it is. Well, we probably don't. We, but we now start to talk a lot more. If you look at, now, uh, these Essex are, some of people are driven by saying, well, you know, this is the right thing to do to start with. Others probably say, well, if I don't do it, my business is going to crash. Okay, so it's much more utility driven. But whatever it is, I think if you look at industry and the government, and the, the, the whole thing about this, uh, this uh, data, uh, you know, data privacy and the data utility by Census Bureau is, is a big discussion is, is, is really on this data ethics, right? And what the other one is, is, is actually really, um, if you think about, uh, research is something that traditionally has always been thought research is what academia, what this research tank does. But now if you think about it, what is emerging, what is the, uh, that uh, um, for all these sectors is that we, everybody's doing lots of research. 
for the right reason or for the wrong reason. One of the reasons, a lot of reasons you have to do is because the data, data are private. Companies, you know, they do those things that, it, first, you know, industry has been leading a lot of those, those things. And the government itself, it's really doing a lot of research. For example, this whole, again, I want to take, talk about the Census Bureau. They are the ones, like, nobody is solving the problem for them. And I talk to them quite a bit. They, have, they get, I think, Harvard has quite a few faculty gets involved. But they're really building internal teams to really do this thing. Like, how do we do this data, uh, data uh, uh, privacy and utility trade-off? And because those things are, you know, the, all the data are up, private, you cannot, you cannot really just uh, do it. So they really internally, you have to have these kind of uh, uh, research teams. And I think that that's a really great because that makes the research itself, when I say research is, is very broad. Uh, when I say research is not there, like they're just applying some methodology to implement. They actually have to do research according to the problems, local problems they have. And that generates a lot of opportunities for students. The internship, all the things, you know, they will just, when anybody does internship, you know they're going to throw you some problems that, that, that for you to work out. Now, uh, I, I like to play with the words that I realize this has a, uh, this has a simple abbreviation called ER, and I, and I want to just say, conclude my talk by bring ER into this whole picture. Uh, you probably know what the ER means, right? If you've ever been to an ER room, which any of you uh, in the past year had to go to ER? Okay, well. All right, I, I hope you went there not for the same reason I went there. I went there because I had a kidney stone. I was, it's the same reason? My dad. Oh, oh my, okay. Well, sorry for your dad, but it's good for you. Uh, <laughs> gosh, kidney stone is extreme painful. I was on the floor. This was the first time in my life I realized why all these painkillers is so powerful and dangerous. I was literally on the floor. See, anybody wear whites or blue, I would be begging them to give me a shot. To, and I know I was ridiculous, but the, the, the pain was just so much. Well, why do I even bring the pain here? Well, uh, the ER does signals quite a few things. I think it's actually, it's obviously I'm playing with the words, but it actually is important to think about what's happening now because there's so many. What does ER signals? Well, it's critical. Something is very critical, uh, vital, right? That's the whole idea of your, your, your in the room. That's uh, urgent. That's what's happening. All these little research we're doing, the data science, it's a lot of things that we're doing is really fundamental work or urgent. Uh, hope, life, all the great things, ER. But of course, ER also signals other problems, right? Crisis. Now, when you're ER, you know it's probably too late, okay? You shouldn't, you shouldn't eat that much sugar and all that stuff, you know? Um, desperation. A lot of things like, you know, working out, it's, it's a lot of problems now is, Way too much data. I need to get this done. It's it's a overwhelmed, temporary rush. This is the one that I was really want to think about. Like I was thinking, it's like yeah, a lot of things that we're doing now, particularly in an industry government setting. I need to produce this thing. There's so much data. I just do anything. Okay, it's like a ER, like just save me for now. I, you know, it may be bad for me, because but you know, the ER job is to get you you're still alive, so you can have a follow up with with someone else. And uh, you 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 will have a lot of these uh, these. Uh, we're all sleep deprived. I hope you understand what it means. And you know, unfortunately, that ER also means death. And you, that you probably see a lot of uh, uh, the the kind of problem we worry about these days in this particular ethical research. Uh, I don't have time to talk about AR part. Is that you know what the one of the worries is is because things are so fast, so massive. Like a, one mistake you make, it could be a massive mistake. And that's the scale of that thing. And uh, uh, it's, you know, I don't like this doomsday, you know, because things like read really terrible, but we do have to be careful uh, just because the scale and uh, the, the way we can, we don't have time to react, we have so many things to work on. It's, it's an absolutely terrific time for any of us. Uh, well, first, to be alive is great. Second is that, you know, you just have so many things to do, but we do all have to sort of, you know, think hard about what I, what I, what I talk about. Anytime you need to cut Cut corners, think about do you understand the principle? I really want to emphasize that's a way to you guard it yourself to understand, well, I know I need to sacrifice this, do that, but I know we're cutting because I, I understand. If you don't, come to university, come to any program, do some study. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sheldy. Yeah. For your wonderful talk. We have a few, uh, just a few minutes for questions before you get started. Questions? I think they are thinking, where's the coffee? <laughs> That's 
So thank you. Uh, so in terms of the U.S. Census, uh, what do you think the chances are that they did, you know, potentially? What do you think the chances are that we did make a mistake? You know, the calculation on differential privacy. You know, because once it's released, right, as you said, it's sort of out there, and uh, the decision is almost kind of final, right? So, uh, can you talk more about, you know, to what extent this could actually present a problem that they're, you know, releasing this today and they've decided on some level of privacy? You know, is it possible that there's some new technique someday that can, you know, uh, you know, uh, re-identify people given this choice that they made, you know, right now? Well, I don't think any single person can answer that question, but it's a great question. Uh, any of those technologies, I think the differential privacy is, in grand scheme, thing is better than uh, they always been. They have been always doing some kind of protections. By law, they need to do that, and this is a sort of a much large scale and it has much rigorous mathematical base to do it. Uh, you know, old days you swap some data, you do all those things. But you know, they have re-series as well. But this is this. But it first is first is you never know if there's another methodology coming out, right? It's a, it's it's possible. Second, anything you do, regardless how much mathematical guaranteed other things you use, and they are not foolproof, right? Let me make it very clear: differential privacy does not really protect your privacy. What it does is to greatly reduce. The, the disclosure of your privacy due to the release of that particular data set. So if you like to put everything about you on Twitter or Facebook, nobody can help you, all right? Because that's your problem. And, but this is just sort of say the government don't accidentally, for good purpose, release your data. So that's the thing. So there's a, it's always a relative scale. And it's a great question. And I think once it's released and they are still working on it, I'm sure they will be, you know, the sense they will learn, they will, they will uh, uh, you know, try to improve. The census coming every, every, every 10 years. Um, but it is, you're absolutely correct. Once you're released, you're, you're released. And there's no go back. You can do the next 10 years. But that data set will be forever there. So uh, that's why you know, they're working very intensively at this moment, uh, trying to really make sure that what they do is, is the right uh, balance. But the hardest the question is they need to, for those who understand, there is a thing called a differential privacy budget. There's epsilon. There's a what epsilon you should choose. That's a tough, tough question because that should be chosen in some sense by the society. But you know what's going to happen if you do that. And it just, you know, so that's, somebody has to make some tough decisions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very nice. Uh, particularly very impressive about one sentence you mentioned that when people think uh, let data speak it, uh, by itself, let data speak when you model it, but actually there is subjectivity of how the data was collected. Uh, and thinking on that, it uh, reminds me of a famous example that the computer vision, when people try to use the internet image to train a machine be able to recognize human, um, didn't really thought through in terms of what kind of data, what's the goal they want to achieve for what kind of race and collect what kind of data and end up with human be recognized as animals, which is unfair. So that actually brings up another kind of aspect relating to data science, which is fairness. Um, so kind of two, two things. What do you think about data science role in terms of helping to write up a protocol before we analyze it, even before collect the data, kind of like design stage, how to design the data collection or experiment. And second is about fairness. So uh, I know privacy is very important, uh, but beyond privacy, uh, how to uh, put into the protocol objective what kind of fairness we want to achieve before we conduct any analysis. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, answer to each of them will be another one hour talk, so I'm not gonna uh, get into detail, but just very quickly, uh, the fairness itself now become a part of this. The, there's a whole research area, it's called uh, algorithm politics. There's uh, fairness, accountability, you know, interoperability, there's all sorts of things. There's, there's a lot of work needs to be done, and, and uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just beginning. And again, that's a question uh, not just, it shouldn't be just addressed by statistician or computer scientists. It should be 
legal scholars, the, the, the philosophers all come in. But I want to address your first one, say, how do you think about from beginning when you design the data, like, you know, to avoid all, you know, all these biases? I think the one thing I'm going to close very briefly using the following, uh, I've been telling people about this, uh, hopefully help you to remind. Uh, you know, people say in real estate that the, the three most important factors is location, location, location. And for me, do data science to prevent yourself with making all, all these mistakes, the three most important thing is selection, 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 right? The idea is that we selected what we want to study, we selected what the data we want, we, we select the methodology, we select the theory, we select to, to, to interpret all those things. Now, selection themselves are not wrong, not because we have to do those things. What's wrong is that any time you do a selection, you're changing the denominator of your probability calculation. Probability is a ratio. On top is what things has happened, at the bottom is how many things could have happened. Anytime you just do the selection, your, your denominator changes. So the problem is that if you, if you do not adjust for these selection biases, you can get any kind of impressive re results. As some of you probably have heard, the statistician will say, if you torture data enough, the data will confess. <laughs> Thank you very much.